The story of Roland is one of the most expansive tales found in the world of music technology. Under various guises and brands, the list of products attributed to them is almost innumerable. But it's not quantity alone that makes Roland so noteworthy. It's a selection of iconic and enduring inventions found within their catalogue. It's no exaggeration to say that entire genres of music would be totally different if it weren't for Roland, and some wouldn't even exist at all. This is Land of the Rising Sound, a Roland retrospective. The story of Roland begins in Osaka, Japan in 1930 with the birth of Ikuturu Kakahashi. His early life was no walk in the park as he was not only orphaned as a young child but also lived through World War II and the ensuing food shortages. In his teenage years Kakahashi learned to repair clocks, watches and radios and ventured into business for the first time. At 20 years old Kakahashi spent several years in hospital having contracted tuberculosis, only surviving thanks to the trial of a new antibiotic. The Roland story came perilously close to never having happened at all, but fortunately for us, Kakahashi was back on his feet. In the mid-1950s, still only in his 20s, he set up shops selling and repairing electrical products. These were familiar items such as clocks, watches, TVs and radios, but Kakahashi had his eye on something else. Musical instruments. By 1960, the business was growing and Kakahashi changed the name to Ace Electronic Industries, also known as Ace Tone. The first commercially released instrument they designed was the National SX601 organ that was manufactured and distributed by Technics, also based in Osaka. In 1964, they put out the first product under their own name, the R1 Rhythm Ace. This machine could produce transistorized emulations of drum sounds by pressing buttons on the front panel, but it had no method to sequence them into rhythms. It hardly set the world alight, but it got Ace Tone started, and of course, this was the earliest ancestor of some rather famous inventions that were still a couple of decades away. By 1967, Ace had come up with a solution to arrange their drum sounds into patterns via a diode matrix, and they incorporated 16 preset rhythms into the FR1 Rhythm Ace. The FR1 was such a success that it was picked up by Hammond for use with their organs. The close allegiance with Hammond deepened over the years with the joint venture Hammond International Japan being operated by Ace Tone. They also developed their own organs such as the Top 3 Combo and the Dual Manual GT7, which went on to have a strong influence on Hammond's own X5. By the early 70s, Ace Tone were turning over tens of millions each year, selling an increasingly diverse range of products. However, Kakahashi was unhappy with the shareholding and investment situation to the point that he quit his own company in 1972. A few weeks later, he founded the Roland Corporation. The first ever product they released was the TR-77 rhythm instrument. This was the first time the TR moniker was used, standing for transistor rhythm. Also known as the Rhythm 77, the unit was largely a development of Ace Tone's earlier FR-8L Rhythm Ace, in both appearance and functionality. Clearly designed for organists, the TR-77 is flat with a music stand on top. It offers various 2-beat and 4-beat patterns via the rotary switch on the right-hand side of the instrument. These can then be combined with either a Latin rhythm or a jazz rhythm, but those banks cannot be mixed, as the manual describes. The Latin rhythms do not come out unless Latin is on. This device is for prevention of mixture of jazz rhythms with Latin rhythms. Heaven forbid. It has six individual balance levels, master volume, a tempo slider, an up-tempo switch to jump instantly to double time, a fade switch and fade slider, a metronome and an input for foot switch control. Pretty comprehensive for 1972. Two simpler units, the TR55 and TR33, were also released that year, again marketed at organists. A year later, Roland put out their first synthesizer, the SH-1000. This was also the first time the SH abbreviation was used, coming from the Japanese word synthesizer, 
which, no prizes for guessing, means synthesizer. As well as Roland's first synthesizer, the SH-1000 holds the title of Japan's first mass-produced synthesizer. It was an affordable and robust instrument with 10 preset sounds, three wave shape options from its one oscillator, two noise sources, a resonant low-pass filter, one envelope and two LFOs that are set up to give you tremolo via the VCA, vibrato via the VCO and growl, wow and envelope mod via the filter. There's also a glide switch and portamento control. Not a bad start at all, in fact it went on to appear in the music of Blondie, Vangelis and the Human League to name just a few. In the early days, Roland also put out their first compact effects box, the AF100 B-Bar Fuzz, which sounds so 70s I'm surprised it isn't wearing flares. Talking of effects, 1974 was also notable as Kakahashi rebranded a second business he'd set up the previous year. Initially called the Music Electronics Group, it was retitled as BOSS. It was a name that was to become synonymous with stump boxes. More on that later. In the same year, Roland released the world's first electronic piano with velocity or touch sensitivity, the EP30. I bet you didn't know that. 1974 also saw the release of the RE201 Space Echo. It was by no means the first tape delay device as this technology went back into the previous decades. Here's one of Ace Tone's earlier units, the EC10 from 1972 that was one of the forerunners of the Space Echo series with the same input configuration and mode selection dial. In fact, Roland had themselves released two earlier Space Echoes that were actually the groundbreakers. But the RE201 went on to become arguably the most famous of all the tape delays. It was used in recordings across such a broad range of music that there was enough demand to keep it in production for 16 years. The Space Echo would record incoming audio onto a loop of magnetic tape held within a chamber. Users can view this in action thanks to its transparent plastic panel. The 201 didn't employ the usual array of capstan-style spindles and instead the tape would bend and coil freely within the chamber and by some wizardry of design, it wouldn't get tangled. This solution allowed for a much longer piece of tape than was previously achieved, which simultaneously reduced the wear. Win-win. The loop ran across three playback heads and the tape speed could be altered to change the delay time. It also had multiple inputs with balance control, a built-in spring reverb and EQ, and it could even self-oscillate. The sounds it creates are still so popular that it's been cloned, emulated in software and even reissued as a digital effects pedal. Back to synths, the SH-1000 had been followed by the pressure-sensitive and preset-based SH-2000 and the excellent SH-3 and 3A. The next in line was the SH-5, a powerful dual oscillator monosynth. The SH-5 combined two multi-mode filters with flexible routing and deeper features such as stereo panning and ring modulation. Back to BOSS, they'd wasted no time in getting great effects units into production, and in 1976 they put out this classic, the BOSS CE1 Chorus Ensemble. This unit was an analogue chorus and vibrato device. It had been built upon the technology already developed by Roland for use in their popular jazz chorus guitar amplifiers, but the key to its success was the stereo output that was a hit with guitarists and keyboard players alike who wanted to create a wide sound. A high seller at the time, they continued to be in demand over 40 years later. 1976 also saw the release of more sophisticated synthesizers with the introduction of the System 100. This was designed around several different modules. There was the 101 synthesizer, the 102 expander, 103 mixer, 104 sequencer and 109 speakers. It was used by the BBC Radiophonic Workshop and Tangerine Dream, and then later by artists like Aphex Twin and Orbital, as the potential to delve deeper into the system was obviously appealing to more experimental musicians. And the music you're hearing at the moment was created entirely on a System 100. 
Roland's first fully modular synthesizer, the System 700, was also released in 1976. This was, and still is, a very high-end instrument that competed with Mogan Arp's modular systems of the same era. The original list price was 2.65 million yen. Adjusted for inflation and converted, that's around £35,000 or $45,000 in today's money. The System 700 is therefore certainly the highest spec instrument Roland ever produced. Not for the faint-hearted, the system comes with a main console and controller keyboard, and then up to five additional blocks that can be added to extend functionality through a total of 47 modules. The main console has... Three oscillators, two filters, two amplifiers, two LFOs, two envelopes, ring mod, sample and hold, phase shifter, voltage processor, envelope follower, integrator, a mixer, multi-jack, spring refurb, voltage control, panning and stereo VUs. It's also normaled, meaning that a basic signal path can be set up without the need for any patch cables. Select your wave shapes, assign a filter, amplifier envelope, pan the VCA outputs, dial in spring reverb to taste, and even the most basic sound is... enough to make a Spartan flinch. But of course you can then dig in and plunge down the modular rabbit hole within the main console and the additional blocks. These systems are obviously highly specialist and we're incredibly fortunate to have one to demonstrate, including one main console and two additional blocks, giving us multi-jacks, analog switching, stereo delay, stereo phase shifting, a third VCA, frequency to voltage conversion, a second envelope follower, gate generation, multi mode filters and a mixer. To appreciate the system properly, listen on monitors or headphones and in stereo. At the other end of the spectrum, in 1976, Roland put out a string and brass synthesizer, their second in fact. Even though it got there first, the earlier RS-101 wasn't much of a success, but second time lucky, the RS-202 was a different story. It was fully polyphonic and had two string sounds and one brass sound that could be combined. There were two interesting features that were introduced on the RS-202 that would become staples of the Roland family synth sound. One was a delay feature for the vibrato that could be manually set, and the other was the ensemble effect, building upon their now vast experience with chorus units. More on that later. The RS-202 was a popular choice for disco string sounds. Looking for the next natural progression in music technology, Roland collaborated with Ibanez in 1977 to produce a guitar synth system with the GR500 and GS500 components, the latter being a modified guitar and the former being the synth module. Used by Alex Lifeson of Rush, Tangerine Dream, Pat Metheny and Genesis, the guitar synth was designed around a 24-pin multi-core connection that allowed the player to perform straight guitar sounds, poly-ensemble synth sounds, bass synth sounds, 
melodic synth sounds and interface with an external Roland synth. These sources can be amalgamated into whatever combination was required. The player could also assign certain sounds to certain strings and send different signals to three discrete outputs or a global mix. So it was a fascinating prospect to those who could get their hands on it. And remember, this was a good half decade before MIDI. On a related note, Roland were deep into microprocessor controlled sequencing even as long ago as 1977. That year, in collaboration with composer and inventor Ralph Dyke, they introduced the MC8 microcomposer, which was revolutionary at the time. The unit had eight CV and gate outputs, meaning that it could handle polyphonic parts or be hooked up to multiple modules of a synthesizer that could be managed by a control voltage or gate, such as a filter or envelope. It could also store sequences of over 5,000 notes, although all this data had to be tapped in manually by hand, and the volatile memory meant that your hard work was wiped every time you turned the unit off. The solution was back up to a cassette drive. Amongst others, the MC8 was used by the Yellow Magic Orchestra and also by Martin Russian on the Human League's Dare album. The next stop on our Roland tour is 1978, and what a place to stop. A collection of rhythm machines had been put out by Roland by this point, but their 1978 offering proved to be an enduring one, with the release of the CR78. Dubbed CompuRhythm, the 78 was the first to use a microprocessor to manage its rhythms. It had 34 presets that hark back to the earlier organ eras of cha-chas and bosses, but these could be combined and varied thanks to some extended controls. It also had four slots for custom rhythms, making it semi-programmable. These rhythms had to be manually tapped in via the WS1 programming switch. A bit clunky, but it worked. The CR78 went on to appear in Blondie's Atomic, Phil Collins in the Air Tonight, Visage's Fade to Grey and John Fox's Underpass to name but a few. Also making an appearance in 1978 was the Jupiter 4. This beautiful synth offered four voice polyphony with one oscillator per voice or monophonic sounds with all four oscillators stacked together. It had preset sounds via the buttons below the keyboard, including one called The Force, how 70s is that? And eight slots for your own patches. As the name Compuphonic suggests, the synth used a microprocessor to store digital equivalents of the control voltage values in memory via AD to DA conversions, something EMU systems and sequential circuits had pioneered with the Prophet 5 earlier the same year. The Jupiter 4 had an arpeggiator that made an appearance in Duran Duran's hit Rio a few years later, and it was also used by Spando Ballet, Simple Minds, Gary Newman and the Human League. Talking of the Human League, a monophonic version of the Jupiter 4 dubbed the Pro Mars was also released in 1978, and this very unit used to belong to a Mr. Martin Ware, meaning that it was quite possibly used on Human League recordings. Roland's SH series was still going strong, and in 1978 they'd released the latest two incarnations. Firstly, the SH-7, which was a dual oscillator synth that could produce two-voice polyphony, making it duophonic. It had two envelopes, one clockable LFO, oscillator sync, sample and hold, ring mod, and flexible modulation and connectivity. Like the SH-3 and 3A before it, the SH-7 has an interesting division of VCO1. Square waves are split out and then divided down, meaning that you can combine different octaves together. This makes up VCO1A, and then you still have the other waveforms available to you on VCO1B. Combine that with the second VCO, a noise source and ring mod, or an external signal in the mixer section, and you can overload it in a lovely analog way pre-filter. This makes the SH7 quite different from the earlier SH5, and in fact, from any of the other Roland synths since. Like the SH5, the SH7 is very rare nowadays, and was one of the last green-faced Roland products. Wow. 
The other SH series synth from 1978 was the SH-1, which was starting to look less like the earlier SH synths and more like a famous model that was going to appear in a few years' time, although its sound is very reminiscent of the SH-7. This incarnation was the first to include a divide-down sub-oscillator and proved popular with musicians selling well. As we're fortunate enough to have four of these 1978 Rolands in the same place at the same time, there's only one thing for it. String machines were going strong and Roland released the latest incarnation, the RS505 Paraphonic. It had separate synth brass and string sounds and used divide down technology to achieve full polyphony. Paraphonic means that the sound passes through a single filter and VCA. Continuing on from 1976's semi-modular System 100 and fully modular monster the System 700, Roland released the System 100M three years later in 1979. There are a couple of dozen different modules available that can be arranged into custom setups in various rack sizes. The system could be sequenced or played using a controller keyboard and manually or externally gated. Unlike the System 700, the 100M is not normal and so to get any sound out of it you have to patch in a desired signal path. In this example system we have a pretty classic setup, the dual VCO112 module, the dual VCF121 module, the dual VCA130 module, the dual envelope and LFO140 module and finally the 150 module that gives you ring modulation, sample and hold, two noise sources and a second LFO. The several in and outs on each module but the multiple jacks at the bottom of the system mean that signals can be split further or combined and split. This means that the number of possible patches is huge but it's within a synth that's actually pretty compact and relatively simple. Here's it next to a Korg MS-20 from only a year earlier as a size reference. But of course, if you were more experienced, cases of System 100Ms could be chained together, as was done in elaborate fashion by legendary film composer Hans Zimmer. Armed with patch cables, you can dig in and start building bass sounds, lead sounds, effects, textures, percussion and drums, as I will now attempt to do by creating a track using only the System 100M. Thank you. 
Russ also ventured into drum machines in 1979 with the launch of the DR55, the first of the Doctor Rhythm series. It's worth noting as it was one of the earliest affordable programmable drum machines and whilst it was basic it was used by the next wave of musicians such as The Cure, Depeche Mode, Soft Cell and Thomas Dolby. Nineteen seventy nine also saw another iconic instrument unleashed into the wild as the VP three thirty Vocoder was released. Although it wasn't by any means the first Vocoda ever made, and not even the first Vocoda Roland had made, it combined string and voice sections with the Vocoda signal, vibrato, pitch shift, and some further simple but effective sculpting controls. We can also add the ensemble effect by turning on this rocker switch. Stereo ensemble. There you go. As a result, the VP330 became a studio staple and is still being emulated and cloned to this very day. And that brings us to 1980, the dawn of a new decade, and fittingly, right at the inception came arguably the most famous drum machine of all time, the TR-808. A fully programmable, all-analogue powerhouse with some of the most instantly recognisable and ubiquitous tones of the last 40 years, the 808 was initially a relative flop. Although it appeared in important songs such as Marvin Gaye's Sexual Healing and Soul Sonic Force's Planet Rock, the 808's charge was quickly blunted by the almost simultaneous release of the Lin LM1, the first drum machine to feature digital samples of real drums, which I've already covered in another video. Link in the description. As the story goes, the 808 was discontinued after a short run due to poor sales and wound up in pawn shops selling for under $100. It then found its way into the hands of young musicians who were strapped for cash, and they began experimenting with it. Its sound became intrinsic to several emerging music scenes, most notably hip-hop, and the 808 went from zero to hero over the coming years, and 40 years later, you'll have to have several grand in your pocket if you want to get your hands on an original unit. The TR-808 synthesizes every one of its sounds within circuitry. For example, that famous cowbell is two pulse waves tuned at an irregular interval that pass through two VCAs that are shaped by an envelope. These are combined and run through a bandpass filter and onto an amplifier to give you every time a trigger comes in. This is true of every sound within the 808. There's no digital audio, no samples, just clever synthesis. And the overall effect? Well. As if Roland hadn't made enough iconic instruments by this point, they rolled out three more in 1981. First up was the Jupiter 8. Now hallowed as one of the holy grails of synthesis, the Jupiter 8 was a major player in the story of truly polyphonic synthesizers and their impact on popular music. Based around classic subtractive synthesis, the design combined newer inventions such as patch storage, varying keyboard modes and a DCB interface to sync it with other Roland products. It was an analog dream with digital control, and just check out that design. Iconic is no overstatement. The Jupiter 8 was used by a who's who of 80s artists, including Toto, Duran Duran, Prince, Howard Jones, Frankie Goes to Hollywood, Rush, Huey Lewis in the News, Depeche Mode, Stevie Wonder, Tears for Fears, Vince Clark, Queen, and many, many more. There were in fact two models, the earlier JP-8 that had some reliability issues, and the later JP-8A from 1982 onwards that had the initial issues ironed out. The Jupiter in this video is a JP-8A. 
Amazingly, we're still not done with 1981, as that year Roland also put out two little silver boxes, one of which would go on to become one of the most influential instruments in electronic music history. I'm of course talking about the TR-606 Drummatics and the TB-303 Bassline, the latter of which is our icon in waiting. The story of how that occurred wouldn't happen for several years, as we'll see. The intention of the 606 and 303 was as programmable drum and bass guitar units to accompany lone keyboard players and guitarists, and the initial adverts and descriptions in the manual reinforced that this was clearly the concept. Which means this. And unless you're Kip from Napoleon Dynamite, it's easy to see why this didn't catch on. The 606 sounds nothing like real drums, and the 303 sounds nothing like a bass guitar. To make matters worse, the 303 was kind of baffling to program, with pitches and note values having to be tapped in a step at a time, and bars of music chained together in patterns via rotary switches. Even more confusing was the fact that only a Japanese manual was initially available, and when an English manual did emerge, it was over 90 pages long. The 303 and 606 were a flop, and with sample-based instruments and drum machines with more intuitive programming hitting the market shortly after that actually could reproduce the sounds of bass guitars and drums, these silver boxes were weak competitors and were discontinued within two years. But we'll pick this story back up a little later. Seeing the need for affordable polyphonic synthesizers, Roland released the Juno 6 in early 1982. As the name suggests, it had six voice polyphony, but with just one oscillator per voice, it was hardly going to sound massive. Aware of this, Roland employed two tricks, the old divide down sub oscillator and their legendary chorus, which had two settings, or three settings if you jam both buttons on at the same time. Listen to the difference those two elements make. The architecture of the Juno 6 is simple, a square wave and sawtooth wave can be mixed with the sub oscillator. It has pulse width modulation, one envelope, one LFO, a resonant low pass filter, a separate high pass filter and a very useful arpeggiator that can be clocked via triggers from a sequencer or drum machine. It doesn't make hundreds of sounds but the limited sounds it can make just sound great and the Juno has remained a popular instrument to this very day as it's a real team player. I've invited some friends over to join the Juno in demonstrating this, one of which is another classic Roland from 1982 that we'll get onto in a moment. One of the inventions that came with the Juno 6 was the Digitally Controlled Oscillator or DCO that replaced the usual Voltage Controlled Oscillator or VCO. A DCO is an analog oscillator that is controlled by a digital circuit to ensure its tuning remains stable. Given the inherent wonkiness of pure analog synths and their temperamental nature when it came to heat, cold, humidity, lunar cycles and stiff breezes, performers had had more than their fair share of looking like a bit of a div on stage when the sound coming out of their instrument wasn't what it was supposed to be. A synth that had near bulletproof tuning was a godsend, and mine is still perfectly in tune 37 years later. The Juno 6 was quickly superseded by the Juno 60, which added patch memory and DCB connectivity. It also had a switchable high-pass filter rather than a continuous one, 
As alluded to earlier, 1982 also saw the release of another enduring Roland product, the SH-101. Between the SH-1 and the SH-101 there had been the popular SH-9 and SH-2 models, but if those were distinctly 70s in their looks and sound, this little monophonic synth was unquestionably 80s. It's lightweight, comes in light grey, bright blue or cherry red, and has a keytar grip and strap attachment. As the original print ad suggests, this synth is all about having fun. The architecture is based on a single VCO which mixes square wave, sawtooth wave and sub oscillator as per the Juno. It has one LFO with four shapes, one envelope, pulse width modulation, a resonant low pass filter, portamento, an arpeggiator, a digitally managed 100 step sequencer, some performance sliders and that's about it. But the combination of controls and their ranges mean that it can create a surprising number of usable sounds. And the connectivity of a trigger for the arpeggiator, sequencer or sample and hold with CV and gate in and out means that users could either integrate it into bigger systems or just fire it up and start having instant fun. The 101 has become collectible nowadays with prices regularly drifting towards £1,000, which is a pretty insane price for a single oscillator monosynth. But its sound and character have endured, probably because it just works and you can be up and running in seconds. It's been emulated in software, reissued in boutique form by Roland, and a clone is even due to come out this year. It looks like the sound of the 101 will be with us for some time yet. The sun set on 1982 and 1983 saw the introduction of a universal protocol in the form of MIDI. I've spoken about this in the Prophet film so I won't go over it for a second time other than to say that Ikaturu Kakahashi would join Dave Smith in collecting a technical Grammy 30 years later for its creation. And when MIDI was first demonstrated to the world it was done by connecting together a sequential circuit's Prophet 600 and a Roland Jupiter 6. The Jupiter 6 was therefore the first Roland instrument with MIDI and only the second instrument ever to come with it installed as standard. The third Jupiter synth to be put out is distinct in the same way that the first two were. It has six voice polyphony with two oscillators per voice but the LFOs and envelopes are digitally generated, as was the evolution of the technology at the time. It has split in unison modes and the waveforms can be selected individually or combined on both sets of oscillators, rather than being switchable as on the Jupiter 8. It also has oscillator sync, cross mod and an arpeggiator as did its older sibling. The Jupiter 6 was widely used by recording artists in the 80s, but continued to get use well into the next decade via artists such as Orbital, Moby, The Chemical Brothers and Goldfrapp. The Jupiter 6 was paired with the release of the JX3P, the 3Ps being programmable, polyphonic and preset. The 3P is slightly curious in that it has holes to connect a stand for the player's sheet music. On its own, the programming has to be done through menu diving in a single slider, but the saving grace of the 3P was the release of the PG200 controller that clips magnetically to the instrument. This gives a switch or potentiometer for each parameter and reinstates the hands-on analog experience. 
The JX3P is actually a dual oscillator synth with two DCOs per voice, allowing for oscillator sync and cross mod. It has the classic roll and chorus, MIDI, a 100 step polyphonic sequencer, and digitally generated LFO and envelope sections. It's similar to the Junos, but not exactly the same, and its somewhat more complex architecture allows for some simple, but slightly more interesting sounds to be programmed. <laughs> Nineteen eighty three was also the year that the Yamaha DX seven dropped, and of course, that was seen as the sound of the future and it dominated the following years with sales in the hundreds of thousands. So the JX3P was never going to be able to compete and was discontinued by 1985. However, it's since had a resurgence and is a great workhorse synth. It's even been reissued in boutique form by Roland in recent years. And the first sequencer equipped with MIDI? Yep, it was Roland. The MSQ700 also included DCB and DINSYNC for their earlier 80s gear. It was also in this year that Roland put out a groundbreaking module, the CMU800R CompuMusic. You know the one, right? Of course you don't. You've never heard of it. But it's worth mentioning as it was the first ever sound module with multi-tumbral voicing through independent lead, bass, polyphonic and drum sections. It had to be controlled by a computer such as an Apple II or Commodore 64, but this is arguably the earliest example of the kind of sound modules that were to become dominant in the decades to follow. But probably the most familiar release of 1983 was this box. Designed by Tadeo Kikamoto, who had also worked on the 303 and 808, the TR909 was a hybrid of analog drum sounds and digital samples of hi-hats and cymbals. It also had MIDI and a more advanced sequencer than its predecessors. Unlike the flabby and snappy tones of the 808, the 909 was aggressive and punchy, which lent itself to music genres that again, didn't exist yet. A familiar story unfolded as the 909 was a commercial failure and was discontinued after a short production run. Fledgling producers picked up cheap second-hand units, and by the late 80s and into the 90s the 909 was everywhere. An integral part of techno and house, the 909 crossed over into the mainstream and was widely used in chart music, even cropping up in Madonna's Vogue, Technotronic's Pump Up The Jam and Adamski and Seal's Killer. Lay down a four to the floor kick, some offbeat hats with a slight shuffle, claps and rolling snares, and it's a very familiar sound. By 1984, the impact of the Yamaha DX7 was starting to hit home, and several manufacturers were fighting a losing battle. Over the next three years, a number of big names either closed their doors, were bought and absorbed, or were reshuffled into a different form. However, Roland survived this difficult time for a number of reasons. Firstly, diversity. A look through old Roland catalogues shows them selling guitar pedals, effects units, amps, PA systems, karaoke systems, microphones, organs, electric pianos, sequencers, guitar synths, programmers, and even a digital score plotter. Roland were no one-trick pony, and with broad ranges of day-to-day -day instruments sold to average consumers, this underpinned their high-end products that were targeted at professionals. As such, they were better placed to absorb the impact of a changing synthesizer market. Secondly, they'd consistently had enough successful products within their synth and drum machine lines to mean that they didn't find themselves in a position of unrecoverable investment, as some others did. And thirdly, Kakahashi's shrewd business head cannot be overlooked. He made key decisions, investments, acquisitions and structural changes that meant that Roland weathered the storms. Talking of diversity, let's check back in with Boss and see what they'd been up to since the CE1. In the late 70s, they'd rolled out some groundbreaking compact stomp boxes. This began with the now-dubbed Traffic Light Trio of the SP-1 Spectrum, PH-1 Phaser and OD-1 Overdrive. Guitarists had never seen anything like it, and in fact the OD-1 was the first pedal to even use the term Overdrive. Players now had a rich and controllable distortion in a small box under their feet. This led to the kind of pedal board setups that we now take for granted, that were not commonplace at the time. Realising the potential of the OD-1, Jeff Beck adopted it early on and ran it through his tube amp to get extra sustain and a thicker tone. 
Prince's pedal collection was also dominated by these distinctive primary coloured effects pedals. By the mid 80s, Boss stomp boxes were the staples of pedal boards across the world. There were distortions, flanges, delays, tremolos, auto wires, choruses, EQs, and many, many more. Again, there were some happy accidents, such as the heavy metal HM2 pedal that sounded laughably larger than life when its four parameters were cranked to the max. Nicknamed the Buzzsaw, this effect went on to be the guitar tone of certain corners of the death metal scene, particularly in Sweden. As well as their iconic analog pedals, Boss also laid claim to the first digital delay pedal, first digital reverb pedal, and first chromatic tuner. Still, in 1984, Roland put out the TR-707 rhythm composer that was entirely sample based. Whilst the 707 has quite vanilla drum sounds that can't be tuned or edited, it's carved out a place in a lot of people's hearts due to the music it was subsequently used in and its intuitive sequencer. Its clicky and bright sounds, whether by accident or design, were also a great complement to Roland's synths, they could be easily connected together. The 707 must have initially been considered a professional piece of kit, because the original receipt came with mine and it shows the owner paying 499 in 1986. Adjusted for inflation, that's around £1,300 in today's money, but shortly after, stateside at least, the 707 was being sold for peanuts, along with its later percussion companion, the 727. More on this later. Whilst we're in 1984, it's worth noting that Roland were to release the first ever purpose-built MIDI controller keyboards in that year, with the MKB-1000 and MKB-300. 84 also saw the successor to the Juno 60 with the launch of the Juno 106. It went on to be one of the best-selling synths of all time. Widely used, it's still sought after today and has cropped up more recently in the music of Daft Punk, Tame Impala, Bruno Mars and Chromio. Like the 6 and 60 before it, the 106 is a simple synth that just sounds good. It has the familiar architecture of the earlier Junos, but with the 106 came MIDI, 128 memory slots, polyphonic portamento and two polyphonic modes, the latter of which hold some notes of a chord over to help achieve a natural overlap. The 106 is famous for its voice cards failing, but modern remakes have allowed these synths to keep going well into the 21st century. With plug-in emulations, boutique and plug-out versions, prices of the original instruments have been drifting higher and higher towards sillydom. Not bad for a budget synth that's now 35 years old. Eighty-four also saw the release of the JX-8P, which succeeded the 3P. The influence of the DX-7 upon the 8P is marked with its membrane switches and under the bonnet controls, although the 8P is an analog-digital hybrid and not an FM synthesizer. Perhaps overlooked, the 8P nonetheless is a solid polysynth and wasn't the end of the series as the Super JX or JX10 followed it. If you remember watching a band in 1985, you quite possibly recognise this box that started cropping up on the side of drum kits that year. This velocity-sensitive MIDI device could trigger a choice of electronic drum sounds to complement the real ones, and it was, of course, the creation of Roland. The Octopad itself provided the triggers, but the sounds were generated by the DDR30 sound module that hosted a range of kits so 80s sounding that you can smell the hairspray. Wow, I bet Phil Collins loved this. Oh look, he did. 
A year later, it's also worth noting that Roland made innovations with digital piano technology in 1986 when they pioneered structured adaptive synthesis for use in the RD-1000. In a nutshell, the range of the instrument was broken into 30 zones that were individually treated to match the complex tonal behaviour of the equivalent part of an acoustic piano. Combined with velocity sensitivity, the result was a far more realistic sound than had been achieved before that date. Whilst maintaining the dimensions and weight of an instrument that was practical to carry around on tour, or that could sit in a home or studio. The RD-1000 became the go-to instrument for Elton John, amongst others. But before we go forwards with the Roland story, we have to go backwards. Those 303s and drum machines that had been picked up by young musicians came to the fore in 1987. What exactly happened isn't as clear-cut as we'd perhaps like it to be. The 303 had seemingly died a premature death. That's not entirely true as it did crop up in some charting records such as Rip It Up by Orange Juice, Jam On It by Nucleus, In The Heat Of The Night by Imagination and Baseline by Mantronics. Curiously, Bollywood composer Chiranjit Singh had hooked up an 808, 303 and Jupiter 8 for his 1982 album Ten Ragas To A Disco Beat that had more than a passing resemblance to music that didn't officially exist for several years. Stateside mid-80s records such as Washing Machine by Mr. Fingers and Adonis No Way Back predate what is considered to be the inception of Acid, and yet their sound is very reminiscent of the then undefined genre. It's perhaps more of a convergent discovery than is reported, but certainly a definitive moment was Future's Acid tracks from 1987 that is widely credited as the inception of Acid House, the genre most synonymous with the TB303. As mentioned earlier, the bass line was complex to program and sounded nothing like the bass guitar it was supposed to emulate. This was perfect for Chicago artists such as Future, who had no intention of using it that way. Instead, they took a one-bar loop and used the 303's six rotary dials to tweak and evolve the repeated pattern over 12 minutes into a trippy, mesmerizing and serendipitous sound that has since become immortal. Combined with the TR707 and 727, which are also tweaked and mixed in real time, the sound is about minimal composition and maximum tonal variation. On a 303, that means everything from squelching tones, exaggerated slides, throaty groans, whistling resonance, rumbling pulses, and everywhere in between. Demo tapes got into the right hands and DJ Ron Hardy, producer Marshall Jefferson and label Trax Records were all integral in pushing forth Future and a wave of other artists who adopted this exciting new sound that now had an official name. Combined with a growing rave and drug culture on the other side of the pond, 303 Lace Music exploded there too, and by the UK's second summer of love in 1988 it was hard to avoid hearing that distinctive squelch. UK band D-Mob even landed a number three hit with the track, we call it Acid. And the pivotal role of the 303 can be seen in Europe with song and album titles such as Hard Floor's TB Resuscitation, with songs such as Lost in the Silver Box and TB Stryker. In fact, even Fatboy Slim's first single was titled Everybody Needs a 303. Raves and warehouse parties sprung up throughout the UK, but with notable hubs in the north of England and around London. Fearing a loss of control, Radio 1 were pressured to place some restrictions on songs with references to acid, and the tabloids were emblazoned with histrionics. New laws were brought in and police presence and raids started becoming commonplace. No other monosynth can boast such a reaction to its sound. Chasing more extreme tones, producers experimented with running the 303 through distortion pedals and having them modded. The most common mods being the Borg mod and the Devilfish mod. The 303 could be heard pushed hard in Joss Wink's seminal track, Higher State of Consciousness from 1995. The demand for 303s rose, but the supply was obviously limited as production had ceased years earlier. Prices began to climb and have reached well over a grand 30 years later. Clones and emulations began cropping up and even Roland have since released a boutique version as well as products clearly inspired by the original. But the bass that launched a thousand trips wasn't the only significant Roland thing that happened in 1987, as they released an instrument based around an entirely different concept altogether. The D50. <laughs> This instrument employed LA Synthesis, which stands for Linear Arithmetic. This was Roland's answer to the DX7, but it was a very different concept to the latter's FM architecture. Two sound generators were employed, PCM samples and digital synthesis. Either of these could be selected at the front end of a conventional oscillator, filter and amp signal path called a partial, 
Two partials and a common block that contain control parameters together with EQ and effects could then be used, with a ring modulator if desired, within seven structures to create a tone. Two tones, upper and lower, could be combined in various solo, split and layer configurations to create a patch. The PCM sounds could be used for the attack transients, but they could be looped and used for sustained sounds too. Two PCMs could also be combined within a tone and two tones combined. This new approach meant that the D50 had the means to produce sounds that had never been heard before. With the addition of the PG-1000 controller, the D50 reintroduced a hands-on experience that mirrored the older analog workflow. This was probably the biggest barrier to users of the Yamaha DX7 and part of the reason why its presets were so overused. The D50 elbowed the DX7 from its perch after a dominant run of four years and it was discontinued the following year. There's some great videos on the Roland channel where Eric Persing, who was chief sound designer at the time, and Adrian Scott talk about some memorable presets they created for the D50, such as Soundtrack, Digital Native Dance, and Fantasia. And to add some further nuggets to that, the preset Afterthought was used for the opening of Michael Jackson's Man in the Mirror, and Enya's multi-platinum Watermark album is practically a demo for the D50 in places, particularly the Pizzagogo patch that's all over Orinoco Flow. The D50 was a commercial success and an engineering success, picking up a tech award for outstanding technical achievement in 1988. It's gone on to be celebrated through reissue in boutique form and software, and clones of its presets crop up in other instruments. However, competition was always fierce, and the Korg M1 that was released in 1988 went on to outsell both the Yamaha DX7 and Roland D50. Roland could see that digital was the future and responded by investing in new concepts. Workstations and samplers made up a big part of this and Roland's experiments with this technology was already well underway as they previously released the S-Series models. But it's worth noting the W30 workstation from 1989 as electronic music pioneer Liam Howlett was a heavy user of it and it featured centrally in the Prodigy's early music. There's a short video on YouTube of Liam's very own W30 and accompanying sound discs being played. And of course, it's synonymous with the rave sound of the late 80s and early 90s, as demonstrated by Paolo here. Jumping forward two years to 1991, Roland were again smart enough to combine the latest digital sound production techniques with analog S control, this time through the JD800. Marrying the evolving concept of PCM waveforms and digital synthesis with resonant multi-mode filters, contouring from three envelopes, two LFOs, multi-timbrality and FX, the JD800 was accessible as it was flexible. It had 24-note polyphony, but this dropped by six every time a sound was layered. On the flip side, even the effects could be applied separately to each layer, so the textures it could produce were a worthwhile payoff. The 90s were a prolific period for Roland as they rolled out the first MIDI drum system and also general MIDI that meant there was a template for how sounds were mapped across all MIDI devices which was tied into the release of the first sound canvas module, the SC55. This range went on to be a big seller for Roland but they also put out several others at the time. One such series being the JV range that began with the JV80 released in 1992. The JV80 was entirely digital and had 28 voice polyphony with up to 4 tones per voice. It had expansion slot cards if the users wished to load in further sound banks. It was followed by several other JV synths, most notably the JV1080 in 1994, which was a big success being used by artists such as Ronnie Size, Faithless, Hardfloor and Apollo 440. It had a whopping 448 waveforms, insert effects, 64 note polyphony and again, slots for expansion cards. 
It sold well enough to keep it in production for seven years. A peculiar creation from 1996 is worth mentioning, which is the Boss VT1 voice transformer. This easy-to-use vocoder and harmonizer allowed pitch and formant shifting within a compact box and with an affordable price tag. This is pitch, pitch up, yes, hey, 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 hey. One, two, one, two, one, two. Formant, formant, yes. Larger vocal cords, very deep with a voice going down. Or Smurf, let's go Smurf, with some reverb. Yes. Stop the rock, can't stop the rock, I can't stop the rock, can't stop. That same year, Roland became the first Japanese music company to receive the International ISO 9002 Certificate for Quality Assurance. The V-Series was also a big part of the 90s. There was the VG8 guitar processor that used Roland's Cosm technology to model a range of acoustic and electric guitars, pickups and amplifiers, all with the push of a pedal. Whilst this is commonplace now, the VG8 was the first of its kind. And there was, of course, the V-Drums in 1997. There were two innovations that came with this. Firstly, the mesh drum heads that meant an electronic drum kit finally had the response of a real drum skin. And secondly, the TD-10 sound module that used Roland's aforementioned Cosm technology to give the player 600 kits to choose from and the ability to tweak and customise those kits to their liking. And on a personal note, I remember the parents of several of my drummer friends rejoicing at the invention of a playable drum kit with a volume dial. 1997 also saw the introduction of another memorable Roland synth, the JP-8000. This was their first entirely virtual analogue synth without reliance upon any PCM samples. It had multi-mode filters, effects, an arpeggiator and knobs and sliders on the front panel for real-time parameter changes. Cleverly, what was called the motion control feature meant that movement of the knobs and sliders could be recorded into memory to capture a performance. It also had real-time phrase sequencing, meaning your sequences could be assigned to keys for triggering. The JP8000 is probably most famous for introducing the world to the Super Saw waveform. This is a free-running oscillator that combines seven detuned sawtooth waves together, a sound that would become integral to trance, hardcore, drum and bass and techno. In the latter part of the decade, Roland introduced the V880, which was a portable and affordable mini recording studio in one box, capable of high-quality digital recording. They also released the world's first USB audio interface, the UA100, way back in 1998. I bet you didn't know that. And so to the new millennium. And the number of products Roland were putting out by this point is quite staggering. Way too many to even begin to cover. There were now eight companies under the Roland umbrella, employing thousands of people around the world. Ikatiru Kakahashi was in his 70s and taking more of an advisory role, but still very much part of the journey he started the best part of 50 years earlier, of which the Roland Corporation had made up 30 of those years. Right from the off, Roland were at it again with the VP9000 Very Phrase processor. Dubbed as Elastic Audio, it would analyse a waveform and encode controller data to frequency, pitch, dynamics and timing. There were then three algorithms Roland, available to manipulate Roland, those components dependent Roland, upon whether Roland, they were monophonic, polyphonic Roland, or rhythmic. Roland, this allowed for things that were incredibly difficult up until this point to be accessed in a straightforward manner. For example, samples could be replayed at different pitches but crucially remain at the same speed. Or you could take a groove that was recorded straight and make it swung. Changes to the host tempo would be tracked in real time. We take this for granted nowadays but things were very different even 20 years ago. Your sounds could be stored on zip disks. Remember them? It was used by artists such as Fatboy Slim and Daft Punk. In fact, the robot voice effect it produced was heavily used by the latter on their Discovery album. However, despite all this, the VP9000 wasn't actually much of a success at the time, perhaps because people didn't know what to make of it, or perhaps the emergence of computer software that could do a similar thing shortly after meant that it was made a bit redundant. But the technology within it was far from dead, as we'll see. 
Some standout instruments from the early 2000s were the Phantom series, VP series, VS series, V bass, and V synth series. The latter of which introduced the earlier Veriphrase technology into a synth that allowed for the user to manipulate the pitch, time, and formant of the 300 PCM waveforms on board the instrument. User samples can also be loaded in to create unique sounds, and it could also produce waveforms through analog modeling to combine with the samples. If you wanted to go even further, external audio could be run into the V-Synth for manipulation. Omnia sol temperat purus et subtilis Nuovo mondo reserat faciem aprilis Omnia sol temperat purus et subtilis Nuovo mondo reserat faciem aprilis the 2000s finally saw new Jupiter models with the release of the Jupiter 80 and Jupiter 50. Although these instruments are worlds away from the original creations that bore the same name. The Jupiter 80, for example, uses Roland's digital sound generation Supernatural Technology, which models the characteristics of a broad range of different instruments that you may wish to emulate. So there is effectively a suite of different sound engines to accompany associated instruments. It also builds sounds from three layers labelled Tone, Live Set and Registration. The Jupiter 80 is no reworking of a Jupiter 8, 6 or 4. It's entirely different in keeping with Roland's philosophy of always moving forward. Although, for the nostalgic amongst us, Emulations of Roland's Heritage instruments were made available as a free download pack called Synth Legends Volume 1. The TR moniker also returned with the TR-8 in 2014 that made up part of Roland's IRA series aimed at modern electronic musicians and performers. This range also included the TB3 Touch Bassline and VT3 Vocoder. In 2014, Roland introduced plug-out synths that allowed sound sets to be loaded onto and hosted by the synth. This means that you can effectively transform your synth into a different one internally as and when you see fit. The aforementioned IRA units and plug-out synths also introduced Roland's Analog Circuit Behaviour, or ACB technology that was the latest iteration of their emulations of analog circuitry that they'd first developed way back in the 80s. As mentioned before, Roland did for once make a concerted nod to their past with the introduction of boutique versions of the 808, 909, 303, JX3P, VP330, SH101, Juno 106, Jupiter 8 and D50 again utilising their ACB technology. Up to the present day, Roland continued to be a market leader, offering a broad range of analogue, virtual analogue and digital instruments with the kind of seamless connectivity and control you'd expect of 21st century hardware, but with the quality of sound that Roland have always been famous for. Before all of this, in 2013, Ikaturu Kakahashi finally left Roland, but not to retire. No, he founded the electronics company ATV Technology, and perhaps fittingly his final project was the A-Frame, which was an electronic percussion instrument. On April 1st, 2017, aged 87, Mr K left this world behind. His is a remarkable tale as we've seen. An orphan who started a small shop repairing watches 
then grew it to a global tech giant that had a profound effect on the course of popular music the world over. With an outpouring of tributes at the news of his passing and such a deep legacy, his influence will no doubt continue to be felt for the considerable future. <laughs>